Okay, so um, uh, welcome to this afternoon's uh, session. I'm delighted to welcome back um, uh, Nikki Alford from the University of Central uh, Lancashire. Um, Nikki's going to be talking on, on a topic that um, was one of the first topics we decided to include in this, in this book project, looking at migration um, and indigenous peoples um, uh, in Taiwan. But, um, one of the reasons we were particularly delighted that Nikki agreed to join this, this project was that um, uh, he's worked on, this is his uh, third um, uh, Shuni indigenous project that he's been in, involved in. He was the one that really kind of enabled us to kind of start doing this kind of work on uh, Taiwan's indigenous uh, peoples. Um, Nikki did his um, master in Taiwan studies at National Jeju University in Taiwan. And, and during that time, he published his first book um, on the British tea merchant, um, John oh, Dodd. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and um, that was one of the reasons why, um, when he first came to SOAS for his job interview, um, um, it was probably one of the best job interviews I've ever uh, experienced. And, oh. um, and, and, <laughs> and, and uh, he, I would say that uh, he was part of the real transformation of, of, of Taiwan studies at SOAS that started when uh, I guess it started when when Nikki arrived and then um, uh, really took off even more when um, uh, when when BU uh, joined. So we were an amazing uh, a team of three. Unfortunately, um, Nikki um, left SOAS um, and. First he went to, to Prague uh, for his postdoc, and during his postdoc he uh, finished work on his, um, on, his, in his fir on his third book, actually. No, or fourth oh, book. I, I, wow. I never... Um, um, it really depends on, on, on definitions uh, here. Um, and, and then he moved on to uh, University of, of uh, Central Lancashire. So he's transformed um, Taiwan studies at SOAS, uh, and then he's moved on to have a transformative effect on the University of, of Central, Central Lancashire in, uh, in Preston. Uh, he's only been there for um, two and a half years. Two and, a half, yeah. um, um, and um, already uh, he's, he's a reader um, at that uh, university, which um, is, means he's kind of on the edge of being a, a uh, professor, which is quite remarkable in just a, um, a couple <laughs> of uh, years. Um, not only is he uh, publishing widely, but he's also um, um, become an academic administrator. So, um, uh, a little, um, uh, I'm, I think maybe um, I've had a little bit of influence on um, um, on, on Nikki. I mean, we're, we're both pretty um, optimistic, positive people um, in, a, in a kind of an academic world where it's very difficult to be um, uh, positive and op optimistic. <laughs> uh, um, and um, so one of the things I love about being with Nikki is that um, he's someone who can um, uh, change the, the, the climate. And oh. I think that's what he's been doing at, um, I would say that he's been, he, like the way we developed Tower Studies in, um, in southern England, uh, he's trying to do something similar in the north. Uh, so just a few weeks ago, uh, we were in Preston for the launch of the uh, Northern Taiwan Institute, um, which I think is a really remarkable um, uh, experience. Sorry, a, a, a remarkable uh, achievement. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome him back to, um, uh, to SOAS. So let's give him a big uh, SOAS welcome home. And thank you, Daffy, for such a kind introduction. And I would say um, Daffy has always played a very important, large role in my, um, both my academic development, but also generally growing up as well. Um, I just kind of maybe just begin by adding, adding to this story. Um, um, so my, my choices when I was, what I was trying to make as a, as a master's degree student at, at Junda was to where do I go next? And when the opportunity to work alongside Daffy came up as a, as a possibility, I jumped at that chance to do so. Daffy became very familiar with me in his work as an MA student in Taiwan Studies anyway, so that was a very, very big 
big moment for me to be able to then have that opportunity to work alongside alongside David itself. My actual um, first kind of project I worked with Shani was actually before I came here, and that was on a book called Taiwan Post Martial Law. And I, I was really in the kind of preparations for that book um, that I became much more. Uh, I became much closer to a much a wider extended community of Taiwan Studies scholars, and um, then through my participation and being a member of the board for the European Association of Taiwan Studies, that closeness came. And, um, and this year, unfortunately, I had to step down as being a board member. Um, we have a term limit of six years, so I've done my service for European Taiwan Studies, and retired. <laughs> um, but I still have plenty to give. Um, but um, I was very pleased with, with all these opportunities. Um, I want to kind of talk about a topic that I've been quite passionate about. Um, it's a topic that has played a role in the way in which that I think about Taiwan. And it's also playing a role in the way in which that I want to move Taiwan studies, particularly at our university. Now, the University of Central Lancashire has a has a BA program in Asia Pacific Studies, and we have a very very good graduate who's come come down to kind of the, the summer school now. So Grace, give it a wave. Um, Grace was a top student, um, and uh, the 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 Asia Pacific Studies program is a language based area study program. Um, it the roots into this are through uh, Chinese language, Sinophone languages, um, Korean and Japanese. So Korean is our our largest our, our largest group, but our program is Asia Pacific Studies as opposed to East Asian Studies, which does kind of many ways set it apart from similar programs elsewhere. And a key kind of part of me now, as I as I lead the program, is to really cement that Pacific element within that program, to move it away from the narratives of East Asian studies, which has very strong colonial undertones to it, something that really stemmed from Japanese expansionism, right? Um, to kind of then look at situating these languages and the understanding of its peoples and its cultures into a much wider Pacific area, which in some ways also has certain colonial undertones, particularly with regards to the United States. Um, I'm going to say, unless you want me to finish in 10 minutes, <laughs> postpone this. Um, but anyhow, so this is a kind of a talk, and I want to kind of, kind of pay a bit of gratitude here to a particular professor who, who in many ways is similar to Daffy the way in which that took me under their wings and has helped to guide me, and that is Professor David Brundell at National Genji University, who really opened the doors and opened my eyes in the way in which that we can look at migration out of Taiwan. And um, so this is really through lengthy discussions that I had with him throughout my both my time as an MA student and through my, my, by my PhD research. Um, and then into kind of who I am today. So I kind of just want to really start to put this now down onto paper. So it's the first time I've given this talk. It's the first time I've talked on this as a subject. So um, you obviously have to, in many ways, bear with me as I try to kind of offload a lot of the way in which I'm thinking. And I hope I can do this in an articulate way and it makes sense. Um, and I also try to speak a bit slower now that I've got a little bit longer time. I've often, <laughs> I'm often accused of speaking too quickly, so as I get a bit more excited later on, that may happen, yeah. but I'll try to keep it under check, okay? Um, so ethnohistory, history, I think this is quite important, and this also is about who I am as an academic, but also about my training. Now, um, my background is in anthropology, though um, when it came to choosing a supervisor for when I did my PhD here. There really wasn't anybody in the anthropology department that could supervise me. Um, the closest who became a very close friend to me would have been Bernard Fuhrer, who I co-wrote a paper with um, in the Journal of Translation Studies. But I mean, it really, his, his background really wasn't really suited to me, though he was very keen to kind of work with me. Uh, but then I was very fortunate to be supervised by Dr. Lars Lahman, the um, senior lecturer of Chinese history here. So I did my PhD in modern East Asian history, though I'm not necessarily a historian by methodologically trained. Right? So, but ethnohistory is a branch of anthropology 
that kind of explores theory, anthropological theories, but in its applications to peoples and customs and cultures. Um, in the past, most notably peoples of non-European background. So that's really kind of where I am. And so I kind of want to start my title, which is a slight alteration to the title that you've got, but the topic is not different, and I'll open up that title in a moment. But I just want to kind of look at the where, where I'm coming into this. So I'm coming into this from an ethno-historical background. I'm not a linguist. Um, and much of when we look at early migration, expansionism, tends to be viewed through ethno-linguistic eyes. And I can talk about this, um, but I'm not a linguist. And that's probably why it's important I just mentioned to you that I am looking at this through ethno-history. Does that all make sense? Shall we begin? Okay, so population movements and the constructions of modern tradition. And I really I was really pleased, um, just kind of as a follow-up to kind of Alan's talk, with these kind of contradictions, right? So, I mean, we talked a bit about these contradictions this morning about fact and fiction. And I'm, here's another one of these paradoxical contradictions here of modern and tradition. And I really want to explore this as an element about how do we construct tradition or how is tradition constructed? Uh, but I want to look at this in relation to population movements. Um, and as part of a kind of the new Shirley book project, I want to be looking at this and bringing a contextualized past, but understanding it in a contemporary present, right? And so I will try to see if I can work my way through this. So for, for me, um, there are three key periods of where we see migrations and movements of indigenous people. And the first is the expansion period of into the Pacific Ocean. Um, and then from the 17th century onwards, we see different forms of movements, different kinds of population movements um, through processes of colonization. And I talk a bit about the different types of colonization which Taiwan has been subjected to. And then we have the more contemporary and movement of people, and this is often framed within this rural to urban migration. And a lot of work actually has been done on this, but not necessarily in the English language. Um, but what I want to try to do is to kind of conceptualise this movement, but within past historiography. Does that make sense? Um, so that's basically the purpose of my kind of talk today, really, is to give you that kind of broad overview of the how we understand population movements of indigenous peoples um, as well and things. So we can kind of open up the discussion. Now I will kind of make clear for Daffy that um, this breadth was not necessarily what we will see in the paper, but what I will start to do towards the end of the talk is talk about how that's going to be kind of constructed. So it's going to be, seem a very broad kind of talk, but that's for the purpose of just one, me offloading, but also an opportunity for you to kind of understand how we make sense of this. Okay? So the expansion into the Pacific. Um, this is really quite key when we start to use specific terms, right? So one specific term that we can refer to indigenous peoples of Taiwan is Austronesian. You may have heard the word Austronesian. Now, Austronesian is a linguistic term, right? It's not there are not no such things as Austronesian peoples, right? Like I'm, we, English is a part of an Indo-European language family, right? We're not Indo-European people, right? But people talk, right? And so linguistically, Austronesians must come out of mouths of people. It's just we don't necessarily have terms for those people. This becomes quite complicated, right? And I'm trying not to make it so complicated, but it's important that we are aware of these terms. Um, so, but the Austronesian language family is one of the largest, or it is probably one of the largest linguistic expansions in the pre-Columbian world, right? So there's a period before European language expansion. This had the widest reach. Um, the most, can we see okay in terms of the map? So the most, so we have the Easter Island here in the Pacific to the Madagascar, from Taiwan down to New Zealand. Um, and so this is the extent of the Austronesian language family. Um, what we can start to see from here is its roots, trying to find. So anything that we say, oh, here is an Austronesian language family, oh, where did it all begin? Um, there is a consensus, there's a number of different kind of arguments, but there is a, 
a link, at least a linguistic consensus that the Austronesian language family began in Taiwan and expanded from Taiwan from about 4,000 years before present. Um, now, this is quite interesting where, again, when we start using terms like before present. Now, before present is roughly anywhere before the 1950s, really, when we started to nuclear bomb our world. Um, we just can't carbon date because of the damage to carbon from the 1953 onwards. So when, when it's often used archaeologically as BP, before presence, is that period before the 1950s. So we can't test anything after that. Um, we will also see the common era, which is probably the most used way. So um, these two things tend to be used interchangeably. We're not talking about an extended period before present to actual present, right? Um, so we're talking about 4,000, about 4,000 BP. Um, we see the expansion out, and I'll talk a little bit about this, and we will come back to this map in a little bit later on. Um, and so for, for one is this model called Out of Taiwan. So the Out of Taiwan model is when we look at 4,000 years of history within Taiwan. Now, 4,000 here is referring to the indigenous peoples as we know the indigenous peoples today, right? Um, so they're often known as being uh, 4,000 years. These are Neolithic people. Now, many of the oral histories of a number of different indigenous groups do refer to a Paleolithic people, a people before this 4,000 years, but they would not be linguistically connected as Austronesian speakers. So Taiwan is a proto-Austronesian. This is where, as far back as we can construct it, to the beginnings of the speakers of Austronesian, which is about 4,000 years on Taiwan. Um, when we start looking at this in terms of people and archaeology, we start to know that from about 5,000 BCE, so now we're talking about this in the Common Era, um, we see a versatile culture of fishing and gardening had developed on the south coast of China. And it's quite important to remember here we are not talking about Han Chinese people, we are talking about a very different Neolithic people living on the southern coast of China. Um, they were accomplished at fishing um, in the waters of the Straits of Taiwan. Um, we know from archaeological evidence that they had um, good technology with the use of hooks, fish hooks, and netting. Um, by 2500 BCE, one group had ventured south to north of Luzon in the Philippines and began to settle there. Um, the archaeological records around the Cagayan Valley in northern Luzon shows that they brought with them the same set of stone tools and pottery. Um, I'm not going to go on for that long. Don't worry. Don't really don't worry. Oh, I, I, well, I may. I may. Um, but the archaeological records um, show that they brought with them the same set of tools. So one of the kind of situated within the debate is that actually when we look at it linguistically, um, the archaeology seemingly follows the linguistics, right? Does that make sense? So we're finding that we do see the archaeology making sense with this. And um, particularly this is around the, the, the Dapangan culture, okay? And we're finding this in terms of pottery. The, so the Lapita cultures of the Pacific, which is probably the most representative of the cultures of Melanesia, Polynesia, we're finding very similar kinds of pottery, um, particularly corded, um, the types of clay that are being used, but the dating on oyster shells um, is showing a pretty earlier date um, in Taiwan than that of that. So this is just essentially how we're looking at this archaeologically. Um, so large-scale kind of language families such as, such as Austronesian have spread essentially because of movements of actual founder speakers have occurred, right? So this is quite key here. So we Often we can see a spread of language, but this could be an adaptation from small groups of people who have adapted this language and then not necessarily seen a movement of people. One, or a movement of a large-scale people, one of this could be seen as, say, English on the Indian subcontinent, for example. So we see, or, or English spoken on the, 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 Malaysian, the Malaysian 
part of the thing. So we see a movement of the language, an adaptation of the language, but we don't necessarily see a mass movement of original speaking people into these particular areas. Um, what we do see in the case of Austronesian is a movement of actual founder speakers having to occur. Um, and Proto-Austronesian, as I mentioned earlier, um, was spoken in Taiwan as the homeland of the given language because it's close to that geographical location that first determined that separation. And now, this is not new research, okay? so I'll be really clear here that this is just repeating stuff that's been done really mainly in the 1990s was quite a core period of which this research was carried out. Um, and Proto-Austronesian really is simply the earliest stage of Austronesian that can be reconstructed. So what we do know is that 4,000 years we have this language being reconstructed. Um, this language being constructed, sorry, in, in Taiwan. But as I mentioned earlier, there is this kind of record of a pre-Austronesian people. Um, and that would account for the archaeological evidence that we see um, in, in sites such as Yuanshan, Beinan, okay, where we're seeing sites of much earlier peoples. But we also say we also see it within the kind of mythologies, um, like the Badasa, the Badasa I, uh, ceremony in Master Saisha, for example, talking about the kind of disrespect to dwarf or people of smaller stature. Right? And so there's a lot of this existing. Now, when we start to look at the canoe design of the Yami people or Dao, we start to see this representation appearing on the front of the canoe, this kind of this thing. So it's very e interesting when we start to look at the mythology. So, for example, um, one of the mythology of the Yami people is this fear of spirits. And so costume and regalia around that often point towards something else. But they're obviously the only indigenous group existing on the particular island. And there's very little record of being kind of attacked from, from, from the Paiwan or the Ami on the coast. So this fear of a supernatural other often could be something linked to a, an earlier settlement of people on that island. Um, and so here we can see the pottery. So here in the top, kind of the top left corner is that from, 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 from sites of the Yuan Shan site in, in, in Taiwan. And that is from, from Luzon. So we see similarity in the pottery shards. Um, so one of the questions that often then get asked is a kind of what caused people to move? Or what caused one particular group? The Pai, and the Paiwanic speaking people, which is the group that left, what caused this or encouraged this movement of people? And one argument is to do with population growth. Okay, so we were finding that through abundant harvest, which we can see archaeologically, um, we see that essentially um, early Austronesian speaking people were attempting to avoid the Malthusian trap. Um, and one way in which they did this was just to simply start migrating whole groups of people. Um, and then we start to see this, we can start to see this when we start mapping this linguistically. So what happened over the next kind of thousand years was that we saw Austronesian people migrating south eastward for the rest of the Philippines, the, the Celebus Islands, um, Borneo and Indonesia. But this is not the only story, okay? So this, this is the linguistic and the archaeological story. But um, if we were to just, just kind of, for the moment, to summarize this, pre austronesian moved to Taiwan from southern China, replacing the Paleolithic people that I talked about. A period in Taiwan was necessary. So we are talking about the Neolithic people in Taiwan must have been in Taiwan for a long period of time to become necessary for the different... Austronesian language families, not just languages, but language families to, to develop and diversify. But then we see this rapid movement, which is often known as fast train. Um, this rapid movement through the Philippines into Oceania and as far as east as Samoa. Um, then you would have seen an additional pause for about a thousand years somewhere in the western Polynesia for then the much greater eastern Polynesian dispersal, which would have seen it to... Um, to eat to down to the and across to the Easter Island and down to New Zealand at so the Maori, for example, then up to Hawaii, which would have been a much later. Um, but we're still talking 
thousands of years ago, anyway. But we would have seen a native dispersal, which then, that, which that leads back to this particular map. So here we would have seen the kind of initial one starting around the kind of at the Wallace line here. Um, and then we would have seen the kind of that pause and then that much greater expansion that was happening a little bit later. And this was essentially very quick island hopping. Um, but DNA and the genetic testing is seemingly giving a very different kind of account to the origins um, of austronesian speaking people. Um, and that kind of debate surrounds around here, this period here, where we, where we start to see a very di different genetic makeup, um, and we start to also see certain or specific archaeological findings not being present on these particular areas. And one of that is to do with rice. Um, so we start to see the movement of rice soundwood. Rice has always played a kind of important part of the archaeological basis of this movement from Taiwan. Um, but we don't see it here. And so research, quite a bit of research actually, has been done on that linguistic um, aspect. So we see population dispersal in and around that kind of area just north of Papua New Guinea occurring at the same times that sea levels rose around 15,000 to 7,000 BCE. Um, and genetic evidence that was found, this was in 2016, indicates that the movement of people from Taiwan to Southeast Asia would have brought the linguistic and cultural variations, but it was on a much smaller scale than is argued by those. So there is an acceptance in those who are coming from a genetic background, and I find personally find that quite often quite hard to read because you get the, the kind of the juicy bits, right? Um, the, the fun stuff, right? You get that bit at the beginning, and then the rest of it is just talking about strands of DNA, and that's just then I'm lost. Um, but at least within that kind of that middle section of the work that's being done by geneticists such as Stephen Oppenheimer at Oxford does kind of indicate towards that, well, yeah, we, we, can't, we can't, as geneticists, argue against the linguistic evidence. We're just making the claim that it happened on a much smaller scale. And so one, one thing that they try to do is to kind of unpack this express train part. So, like, yeah, we would have had lengthy settlement in Taiwan for the language to kind of evolve and uh, diversify, but then you have this kind of period where it's quite quick succession. How can we account for this genetically? And that's one of the errors. But what they often argue is some of the pitfalls that we find in linguistic paleontology, um, and that is the cultural reconstruction based on proto-words for cultural items. So, for example, they will look at, say, pig or dog, and they will see how that language is being evolving from the source of entry. And so the genetic argument was to argue that actually that's quite problematic to do that, though I think, I, I think both the geneticists and myself probably oversimplified this linguistically, right, to say I don't necessarily think that that's the argument that they're making. There's obviously something much, much more involved within that. But here is the kind of the, this pit where they find that this is where it becomes quite difficult. So they have here um, the express train from the Taiwanese homeland arriving in Southeast Asia. So they, you know, so we we see this here, but then we see this something going on here. Now I think it's quite important that um, when we start looking at this genetically, we would have had a return, right? It's not necessarily that people would have left Taiwan and not come back. Um, if this is the case that we are starting to see kind of a genetic variant, I mean, to, for genetics to work, it meant that the people must be living in a particular area long enough for something to happen to be different to other people in surrounding islands. But if we are starting to see this kind of return, so later genetic makeup being, being seen and appearing in people um, in the more than north, then we're starting to see that this was opening up as a trade network, right? In actual fact, we start to see this making kind of the early South Pacific kind of history as something much more than we've given it credit for, this movement between islands, both back and forth, and not just simply people leaving and expanding outwards, but we would have seen a continuous return, which opens up quite a lot 
in terms of research into what happened to the people on the Easter Islands, for example. Um, so actually, fact, this has fairly big ramifications for studies across the Pacific, because a lot of questions are asked. What happened to, to the people on the Easter Islands? We have the Easter Island statues, um, but we have very, very little evidence of any kind of extended groups of people living there. But then this, this, this idea of movements back and forth could, could actually have, have something in it. Because it's quite interesting when we actually look at it, if I go back very quickly to that map, I mean, the Easter Island is really, really far away from anything close. Um, and research has been done that the people who of the Easter Island would have been those who maybe would have come from the Americas. But we know linguistically that that wasn't the case. But that doesn't mean that people didn't. I mean, this again is about language and people, right? Pots don't talk, people do talk. But, <laughs> but language can also move without necessarily being attached to that person. It all becomes quite complicated, right? But um, obviously, the more that we look at this, the more if we can accept that there was extensive trade networks between these people, um, the greater our opportunity is to start seeing this bridge between the genetic side of the argument, the Southeast Asian model, and the outer Taiwan model. And anyway. So, there are kind of two things that kind of come out of this kind of uh, models of migrations. One would be to do with population growth. So, population growth means that people were doing pretty well, right, in terms of kind of farming, sustainable farming, would have had to have taken place for there to have been an, expand, an extended group of people to be able to leave. Um, the Southeast Asian model does talk about changes in the environment. So, we see these two things as having impact, and these two things seemingly today also kind of have impact, right? So, um, so this is kind of one thing of which I'm going to be drawing out from this, this idea of population growth and the environment and the impact on the environment. But of course, here when we start to look at the breakup of the foremost languages into their linguistic groups, the Austronesian language family, it is this Paiwanic one that we see is the one that extends outwards. So, I'll tell for all languages that one of the things is to do is the types of words of which that they were using are not found present in some of the other language families. This is one of the ways in which they often make the differentiations. So, some of the words which we do see, and we also see where we get that linguistic and we get the um, archaeological evidence coming side by side. One is in the evolution of boat building. Um, and so, we see the canoes of the Yami Island, we saw them in the talks that we've had over the things. But we see a big evolving of that once we start to see this occurring in the southern parts of the Philippines, um, into areas around Borneo, we see a development of this. And of course these are things taking hundreds if not thousands of years in the process of doing that, but the outrig of canoe is really key to breaking across the ocean. So when we start to see it in this context, we're starting to see that wider spread, the larger sections of ocean being able to be covered. But other things that we see as originating in Taiwan are things such as for facial tattooing, so the tattooing instruments. We see rice as definitely having its earliest origin in Taiwan. We see the type of timber that is used for raising houses, um, as we see in this picture here. Um, sweet potato, sweet potato became an important crop and became an important crop for later migrations of Chinese settlement into Taiwan. The sweet potato played an important role in that. And we start to see dogs and pigs and a bow and arrow. Um, so all of these things we see as having its earliest origin archaeologically in, in Taiwan as a part of that expansion. Um, but that's when we get to that Wallace point of that area where we're not seeing these things raises a number of questions, right? Um, but we're not seeing these as being... Um, so we're seeing a linguistic Austronesian-speaking people, but we're not seeing these artefacts or this archaeology. But that could be a number of... That could, there's a number of reasons for that. They could just be... They just haven't been found yet. Um, or two, it was just not things that were adapted by the people that were living on that particular. So there's a little big question mark going around that fairly large circle. 
Um, but I still feel that there's enough evidence to suggest that at least Taiwan has played a role in the migration. We know people moved. At least we know that much. Maybe we should not become too too ingrained in the origins, but just to kind of look at the acceptance of movements of people from Taiwan did at least occur. Yeah? Why are those faces in water? If someone had a bow and arrow facing at me, I ain't going to stay in the boat. <laughs> yeah, maybe. There we go. No, no, they are. No, they're there for sure, they are pigs. <laughs> The dog is fine, the dog's not going to, he's quite happy, right? Is this where we are, right? I can't, I can't buy, I can't buy that one. That will be the question and answer at the end about what happened to the pigs, right? Um, but there's kind of two things I think we need to look at this, um, really, as we start moving forward, and that is about the landscape itself. So, so space, I think, is always, I mean, space plays actually an important role in my research. Anyway, so as I started moving into this project, it once again is obviously appearing again in my work. And I think it's quite important that we differentiate space here in or landscape in terms of absolute landscape and relative landscape. So when we talk about the absolute landscape, we're talking about that that's made by nature essentially, right? That that we or as us as, uh, as human beings have to adapt to, it's not something we control. So, for example, Taiwan straddles the Tropic of Cancer, right? So this is on the same kind of line as the Bahamas, Mexico, the Sahara, and the Arabian Desert. So we do see, we do see differences in climate. But when we talk about migration, when we look at human migration, one of the things that tends to happen is that human migration tends to follow the same line. Right? And that's quite important to do this because when you start learning particular kinds of techniques and farming, the climate plays an important role in the types of farming that you're doing. So if you were to go too far north, you would need new or to adapt new kinds of technology to adapt to different kinds of farming. right? And if you were to go too far south, you would also then have to adapt. So it involves a degree of processing, right? But by simply moving along a particular line, the climate tends to be quite similar so that we would have similar kinds of agriculture. So this is actually quite an important thing when we start looking at this in terms of subtropical climate. Obviously there's a difference between that of the Sahara and that of the thing that we are, but when we start looking at this within the tropical areas, um, the techniques of farming in the Fujian province were not too dissimilar to the farming techniques needed to be in Taiwan. So therefore, it makes sense for when we're looking at Chinese migration that that was a, 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 a tends to be a form. And the same with European expansion into the Americas tended to follow the single, the similar kinds of lines. But other further south, new types of technology or new types of knowledge were needing to be adapted. Right. Um, we know that Taiwan is subtropical, so therefore um, this is an absolute part of the landscape. The mountainous backbone obviously is something that of which has dictated where migration and what kinds of migration have been moving into these areas. And then we have the Rift Valley down through Taigong, and then the Western Alluvial Plains, which became obviously the main farming plain for Chinese settlement from the 17th century onwards. And so here, just for those who are not so familiar with Taiwan, we have that. So this would be the Rift Valley, the mountainous backbone, so the Tropic Cancer runs somewhere across here, and then we would have this western alluvial plain. But then we have the relative aspect of landscape, and this is things to do with like population. Um, so the population um, of, of indigenous people today is around 2.3%. Um, or no more than 80,000 people. And I think it's quite important that, though we've seen stages of colonizations of indigenous people, we didn't get the Colombian exchange, right? We didn't get this decimation of numbers through process of colonization. In fact, there are more indigenous people in Taiwan today than there were when the Dutch arrived in the 17th century. And this is quite important, right, because this is one of the things we don't often think about. So contact between indigenous peoples and peoples from a mainland continent must have taken place because disease amongst 
European settlers, the Dutch and the Spanish, did not bring with them the disease on indigenous populations as we saw in the Americas. So I think that would be another kind of thing in that comparison with, uh, with, with, with Latin America, was that we didn't see that. So there must have been contact to these kinds of illnesses. There was definitely a resistance to that. Um, so we see more, more people. So this is part of that relative aspect of the landscape. Um, so there was... we. Prior to colonization, there was no intensive agriculture, but there was small-scale farming. Settlement patterns reflected the absolute landscape, so hunting, fishing, gathering, um, all of this was subjected to the kinds of landscape to which the peoples were there. We see this linguistically as well, so um, sea fish obviously only appears on coastal, on coastal dwelling indigenous groups, but then of course the more internal, the more interior you go, the different kinds of fish that you would be dim, so you would have different kinds of words with different kinds of fish, for example. Um, so that kind of moves us onto this kind of second, the second kind of period, and, and that is 1620. We talk about the, the 1492 for the case of the Americas, it's the 1624, really, where we start to see this. So there's the Dutch, I mean, 1622 is on, on, on Ponghu, but the 1624 is really where we start to see this on, the, on, on, on Taiwan proper. Um, but each period, I mean, it, I, 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 as a kind of, when I'm looking at this on the micro history, do tend to have problems with quite large, you know, this, this kind of periodization that we've seen. But this is just a, you know, a general consensus about how periods are. But each period brought a different form of colonization, and I want to talk a bit about this. But just to kind of perhaps stay in line with some of the other talks we are, I have a video to oh, show. Oh. Um, but what I want us to kind of do is to look at how trade and interaction within colonial periods played a role in the way in which we see population movement and migration. So this is a film that was done during the Japanese colonial period of a group of indigenous people going to a trading station to exchange bamboo. Um, I think we should be alright for light, but we have a... I think we should be alright. Let me see. Let me see. Oh, what's going on? of doing this is to look at the way in which population, uh, the way in which the movement, so different, so the, the, the setting up of trading posts and uh, later on in the colonial period, um, like mission hospital posts, actually started to have an effect on the way in which that population movements were moving away from specific communities, okay? So they were becoming more and more reliant on these trading posts rather than on their extended communities and we saw that obviously with the video. Uh, I want to kind of just spend a bit of time just talk about some of the work that I have done. So as Daffy mentioned to you at the beginning of about the two Shani books that I published during the time I was here. Um, the first really was looking at this from a missionary context. We're looking at that during the late Qing period. 
Um, and we start to see the documenting of indigenous peoples in places outside of traditional communities. Um, so here was outside of the, uh, uh, the mission school. Um, we see this we're working towards the constructions of the railways. All of these were done, all these photographs are from Maxwell. Um, James Van and Maxwell, and they're all here in the SOAS archives. Um, here we see again, this is at another kind of a, 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 a trading post just outside of Tang Nan. Um, we see the documentation, very interestingly, is the photographic evidence of indigenous peoples and the movements of indigenous peoples was also then attached to the written word. So Maxwell, he wrote an account of his movements um, towards the interior of Taiwan. Um, also, these are the photographs that kind of accompany some of that text. Um, and we start to see a beginning of the game when we start to look at like yesterday's talk about this idea of appropriation or representation. We start to see people beginning to start dressing in, in indigenous attire. Um, and this played, of course, this also then played an important role in exchange. So one of the things that came up in the discussion, I think, yesterday was on beads, glass beads. And glass beads played a very important thing, not just in the case of Taiwan, but globally as trade beads. So these were beads that were traded for objects, and these objects are that that we see appearing in museums and collections all over the world. Um, and so one of the things that we often find is that the costumes of which that they're wearing most likely were traded by glass beads. Those glass beads are things we start seeing appearing on indigenous costume much later on in the, to the 20th century is the start of the use of this. But this exchange of trade beads was something that we're seeing appearing much earlier. And uh, so in the, I'm glad that from this morning's talk this is something that um, is completely hasn't been set up, but there is a photograph of of the British who then later on took over that part of the Spanish um, fort or in, in Danshui, and this is a photograph of the British in that very fort of which the Dutch fought the Spanish over. Um, and so if, you're, if you know where the British residence is on the Danshui thing, there is, a, there is a pathway now that leads you out to Alethi University and up to Oxford College. Um, that photograph is taken at that entrance there. Um, and just a quick plug, so a lot of this is actually in the second of the two books that I wrote here, so there's, a plug. there's me giving the little interview for Daffy there, so that's done, so there's a quick plug. If you're interested in that photographic evidence, this is readily available for around 1,000 NT in shops. In um, but then of course we start to see a different kind of population movement during the colonial period under the Japanese and most notably was in 1910 during the British Japan exhibition at White City um, in London, in Shepherd's Bush in London. Here we see a forced removal of indigenous people from the southern Paiwan village who were put on display as a living museum in London. And so this was a family of people who were moved to, to London and were put on display. Um, the objects that were left by the Japanese colonial government ended up in the British Museum, um, which is a project that I'm also currently working on. Very interestingly, after the British Japan exhibition, that same group of people were moved to France. In France, they disappeared. We don't, we, we don't know where they are, so, so some French ancestry, right? may well have Taiwan indigenous blood, who knows. But the family, just they, they, the, the organisers of the exhibition went and the family were no, long, were no longer there. We don't know where they went. But that was the British Japan exhibition. This was the formation of the pavilion and this is the village of which was reconstructed. Um, and then just to plug my next book, which is due out next month, which I co-wrote with Professor Hu Jiayu from the Department of Anthropology at Taiwan, looks at that collection in the British Museum. So do have a look out for that. Um, so just going back to kind of colonialism for a moment, Taiwan had different forms of colonialism. So if we look at Andrande's book, the book of which Adam was talking about in this morning session, very much looks at this hybrid form of colonization. Hybrid form of colonization was that the Dutch were there kind of really as like colonial master to the Chinese who were working the farming things, but both were forming a kind of a triangle, almost a kind of a triangular 
um, form of colonization where both were obviously there a settlement. Um, so we start to see that really f right up through into uh, to the end of the Dutch colonial period, of which was then replaced by a settler form of colonization. This was with settlers, Chinese settlers coming over from, from Fujian and from Guangdong. So the settler colonization is that very similar, we see, to the colonizations of, of, of North America by European settlement at roughly the kind of same sort of period of time. We then move into a semi-form of colonization in 1860s, and I call this semi-form of colonization because the British didn't formally colonize Taiwan, but it was having an impact on it in through mission statements, through mission stations, including schools and hospitals. And quite interestingly, one of the things that we found out through the schools, particularly the girls' schools, was that by the time of Japanese colonization, um, Taiwan indigenous girls were far more literate than their Han Chinese counterparts, simply because indigenous communities were not having the same kind of constraints in sending girls to school. And a lot of that kind of evidence on the literacy rates of indigenous girls, and Hakka also by extension, are here in the archives at Sala. So that's just a kind of, to give you an idea that actually a lot of this kind of records um, we find here. And then, of course, from 1895, with Taiwan being part of the Japanese imperial empire, we start to see Taiwan being colonized in much the same way as other imperial colonies were elsewhere. And then we have this period in 1945, which could be argued as being former colonization in exile, um, which would put Taiwan as being kind of really, I can't think of an additional example of where we've had this. Um, so these different forms of colonization gave way to different forms of population movements. And we do, when we're looking at population movements through a colonial, very kind of extended colonial period, we do, take to, you do need to take into account that the different forms of colonizations resulted in different ways in which the people were different motivations for the movements of people as well. Um, and so one of the things that we kind of came out of the talks that yesterday is the way in which that we conceptualize indigenous peoples our understanding of indigenous peoples, or in many ways indigenous peoples' understanding of indigenous peoples, largely comes from that first set of ethnography that was done by the Japanese um, in the beginning of the 20th century. Now, the Japanese had two, basically two decisions to make in times of anthropology. One is the social anthropology of which the British and French had done in terms of essentially learning how to rule. Um, universities like his university was set up very much to train colonial officials in colonial rule. So social anthropology was one option of which the Japanese could look at. Um, the other is cultural anthropology, and cultural anthropology was a branch that really extended out of the United States. But when the United States started to look at cultural anthropology, its understanding of its indigenous peoples was almost too late. That they should have done this much earlier, that the indigenous people that they began to start recording were very much becoming part of an assimilated American people. Um, and so the Japanese who had to make the decision not to, to do a combination of both cultural and social anthropology, and different anthropology, different anthropologists chose different routes. So some of the earlier ones, like Ina Kunori, for example, and then the others in terms of the linguistic kind of um, Looking at this linguistically was to divide them into the nine linguistic groups of which we know as Austronesian languages today. So this was also very quite interesting. But this became the labels of which that we started to see following on through to the end of the Japanese colonial period and then into the post-war period. So we have this unfortunate system of recognised and unrecognised. Now, some of the work of which that I've done with the British Museum is largely artefacts of the unrecognised indigenous groups, which actually did prove quite complicated in our preparations for um, a museum exhibition of that collection was sponsorship for this. Because they come from unrecognised groups, this is objects and artefacts belonging to people seeking recognition. Now, um, the exhibition of that item will be, of those items, will be at the National Museum of Taiwan History in 2021. So the, the 380, not probably all of it, but a large portion of that collection will come to Taiwan for the first time since it left 
and I'm quite happy at the end to kind of talk a bit more about that collection if that's where people are interested in. Um, but obviously, if we, as we know that, you know, even situated within this, there are obviously more than 700 tribal communities that exist even within these recognised and unrecognised groups. So why the unrecognised? I'm not going to talk too much about this because it's probably knowledge already known, but for those who are not, it's this label of Pinkutsu, right? Pinkul people. Pinkul just means people who are plain Aboriginal people, so it's just a term that's used to lump and everyone else. So basically, it's a miscellaneous category of everybody that's not quite yet recognised and recognition, if you go through processes of recognition, will find yourself moving yourself out of the pain pool category and of which the remaining people will remain part. So it's the and others in essentially is the terminology for that. Um, when we start to move now out of the kind of colonial period into a contemporary period about what constitutes Aboriginal land, we still do tend to look at the demarcation of the guard line. Um, so this was a map that was produced in 1901 um, on the Japanese guard line. So here we would have where the indigenous groups are. So the groups that were existing inside this kind of area were those who were either assimilated um, or, yeah, so for those who, are, you know, those who had assimilated, so this would be where essentially where we would have had that kind of plain Aboriginal group. Um, and then this guard line, the guard line, the movement of this guard line varied um, according to the year. So here when we start to look at the extension of that guard line from 1895 to 1909, we see how, how, how long it was. So we see increases of this within the 20th century, so we didn't see a decrease, so to speak. Um, and then this kind of ways in which that we then make these separations between plain Aboriginal people and then later referred to as being mountain compatriots was largely an extension. So, so the government in 1945 just tended to inherit that of which the, the Japanese had labelled and left behind. Um, so when we start moving into contemporary issues, one of the key things here is about official designations and names. Okay? And this is things that we are starting to see changes, but perhaps not necessarily at the rate of which the Indigenous people would like. Um, but there have been two major developments, and this is something I think we've seen from this summer school. One is a rise in interest, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely been a rise in interest in Indigenous peoples and Indigenous studies. Um, and the second thing has been this continuous outflow of Indigenous people from rural to urban areas. So the question that we need to ask is of what, to what extent has this benefited Indigenous peoples, right? So one thing we could look at is to see how long this interest in indigenous peoples has been going on for and whether or not that arise in interest has in turn led to any kind of significant change. Right? Or whether or not that this outflow from rural to urban areas has in a sense benefited indigenous people in the long run. If not, why not? Right? Um, one of the things that we do know that is that household incomes of Taiwan indigenous peoples are less than 40% of its national average. Unemployment is significantly higher than the national average. And tourism, we've seen tourism development in rural areas as being a kind of a direct response to these kinds of problems. But however, I'd argue that tourism in itself involves transforming indigenous cultures into curiosities. And tends to be that these uh, certain indigenous groups would then adapt their cultures or certain forms of cultural practice for the purposes of tourism. We saw this in the moving of the dates of harvest to be more suitable for tourists, right? That would be one example of that. Um, but I think in turn that this also leads to these notions of saviour complex, right? Um, and so we do find that you know, as we start getting these tourists and the things and the plight of the indigenous people mean that we're having to to do to, to you know going into these indigenous communities to set up kind of like clinics and stuff like this, and we're doing these things. There is this savior complex notion that seems to be coming from from the hand majority, um, and that in turn does assert notions of racial and cultural superiority. Um, and this is a complex issue, right? Because to what extent does help and what is the help needed? But this, 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 has, this is something we see in, in, in a lot of development studies, right? Aid itself is often talked about the white man's burden, right? This idea of Europeans helping our Africans, right? And so we see, we see these kinds of notions do and existing, not just within the Taiwan context, but also elsewhere as well. 
Um, so I'll just put a couple of pictures there about this idea of performance, and performance was something that Adam spoke about It came up in yesterday's talks as well. Um, to, what extent do, to what extent is this helping indigenous peoples? I mean, we're, the performance of indigenous peoples is not new, right? This was going on during the Japanese colonial period, and even periods before that was indigenous peoples on display, right? So this idea of this Paiwan group going to London and put on display is a performance, right? I mean, I think with video technology now, it would just be a TV screen, right? Which is a very positive evolution. We don't need to bring the people in, right? Um, and, um, but we're, you know, with this, this idea of performance and this idea of performing indigenous culture is still something that we are still experiencing and seeing today as part of this move movement. So some of the kind of social issues we see is, and this goes back to the kind of the initial talk, is about the conceptualising of indigenous people. This idea of pan-Aboriginalism. The debate over national identity, this kind of a collective identity of indigenous people coming together as one particular group, as a way of debating concepts of national identity, which we see in Taiwan as a whole, and the role that they are playing in that the, they're the role that they play within domestic politics. And we've seen some very interesting discussions before about kind of concepts of voting behaviour amongst indigenous peoples. Um, the indigenous rights, I and mean, it's quite important to kind of situate this historically, that the indigenous rights movements emerged within the large opposition movements that happened in the 1980s. But what's also particularly interesting is the role the Presbyterian Church played in both movements. Um, and that's the work that I did on the first book that I did with, with Daffy. Um, I think one of the key things that came out of yesterday's talk is this idea about disadvantaged peoples. Right, is that indigenous peoples as a collective are not disadvantaged. There may be disadvantaged people within an indigenous community, but there are disadvantaged people in many communities. Right? And I think we need to not look at this as a collective. Indigenous people collectively are disadvantaged. Right? Um, but I do agree with Ali yesterday that we do need to situate this within the past. We do need to situate the social issues of indigenous peoples within historical injustice. But we shouldn't, and this is, this is where my, my, my head gets a bit complicated, we shouldn't necessarily structure indigenous people around historical injustice. Does that make sense? So yes, we should situate it within historical injustice, but we shouldn't structure it around this. Um, and I think one way in which we can look at this comparatively would be looking at black history and its roles of slavery. We should definitely situate black history within the history of slavery, but we shouldn't structure black history around slavery, right? Because there are many kinds of black history that's not surround slavery. Does that make sense? So my idea is that we should be doing the same thing with our understanding of indigenous peoples. Um, so this is kind of bringing me to a close here. Um, so one thing we have seen is indigenous populations has grown, haven't seen a decline over the last 30 years. But this has led to dramatic geographical movements from indigenous communities to metropolitan areas. Um, this is largely for education and non-agricultural work. Much of that work is labour intensive, service sector jobs, assembly line production, construction and driving. We have seen and it has seen increasing cross-cultural marriages. Um, but just to give you some statistics, and I would like to get more up-to-date one, but that's the one I had in the time for preparing for this, um, is that 6%, in 1983, 6% lived outside of traditional communities. By 2009, 39% were living in urban areas, i.e. outside of the communities, and I would suspect that more up-to-date statistics would show an increase in that. The biggest out-migration is actually within the Eastern Huali and Taitong Corridor, and I'll show you a map of this at the moment. But I think this is quite interesting because yesterday we were talking about this on a legal basis, right? And I was having a think about this last night, about this idea about being an indigenous person. But how, and that question I kind of had kind of raised was how does out-migration affect that Article 2.4? on indigenous people's basic law and the definition of tribe. Um, and I think um, Dara actually helped me in his talk about how how that can probably be answered and Daryl correct me if I misunderstood you and that's that concept of law, right? Mm -hmm. 
concept of tribe could be something of which can mean both physical space but also a perception of being part of a tribe. So therefore you can live in Taipei but still belong to Amis, Paiwan, or the tribe or the group of which you've come from. So, um, and I think that's, for me, kind of a, a, an answer to this. So outward migration doesn't necessarily affect the concept and idea of being part of an indigenous group or being an indigenous person. And so this map shows this kind of distribution of Taiwan indigenous people. So this Taiwan indigenous areas, if you look at the green, are following that old line, you know, that old guard line which we saw in the 1901 yeah. Japanese map. We're starting to see that green line. But what we are seeing now is large concentrations of indigenous peoples being in major metropolitan areas. But we are still seeing this kind of that rift valley as still being, you know, very original indigenous culture and indigenous heritage. And that's quite interesting because I was reading um, I was reading things on the history of surfing and it was talking about that that old uh, old ideas of Hawaii for surfing are now more apparent in places like Dulan um, in Taidong than they are in Hawaii. And I thought that was quite an interesting thing. It was one of those kind of like magazine articles. I can't remember where. I was trying to figure out where I read it, but I always thought that was quite quite an interesting thing and that link again back to the past of Austronesian expansion. Right? Um, so just a couple of kind of tables here just to kind of when we start to have a look at this, we start to look at comparisons of college entrance amongst high school graduates. So we start to see, we start to kind of see this difference here. So this, this, this 30 is almost kind of 30% increase, right, that we can see in that. Um, but we are still seeing this difference between those of indigenous heritage going to university and those who aren't. Um, other things, life expectancy, and I think this is, this is quite incredible, right? Ten years difference between being an indigenous man and being a, being a non-indigenous man. I mean, that's significant. And we talked a bit about this, about the industries, the kind of work that we're doing, but then, but then we start to see this also in, in, in the female context as well, those who aren't working in driving, to those who aren't. So, you know, we... You know, we, we are seeing, seeing a significant difference, right? Um, average salary, um, those between 10,000 and 20,000, you know, almost half of the rural population are earning with that. So we're starting, you know, to see this. I mean, one of the things that we do see is a very interesting kind of period between this brackets here amongst urban indigenous peoples being more than the national average in this area. But those Obviously, as we start moving beyond the 60,000 and beyond 80,000, we are starting to see a clear thing. But this also does give indications also about um, income distributions amongst Taiwan as a whole, right? When we start looking at figures like this anyway. Um, so this modern tradition is kind of where I want to kind of end, really. Um, so about how we use or how... when or how will indigenous people in the conceptualization of indigenous, um, ideas of tradition within indigenous, within indigenous society. Um, for me, tradition itself is within the process, right? Um, and the components of tradition, main, the components, the main component of tradition is the maintaining of a living society, right? The whole idea of tradition is to just maintain it as a living community, as a living society, and not something of past, right? Um, but in order to do that, tradition needs to embrace the processes of modernity. And I think that the main, I mean, one particular area which we can look at this in the, in the case of Taiwan is on the men of Dulan, right? We see this in Fortuna Sai's Ami's Hip Hop. Right? And we're seeing that modernity is seen as a social factor, so as self-realization. That actually being modern is a very part, an important part of being traditional within this part of Ami's culture. So Kappa, that age group, each uses the symbols of modernity as a way to express themselves. We've seen this, we see we have video evidence of this during the Japanese colonial period, these adaptations of Japanese pop culture in the 1930s was being used as a way for in 
Ami's indigenous men to express themselves by bringing in what was then to be modern. And we saw this later on. So that, I mean, it's quite interesting if you actually look at Futuro-Sai's video or his film on Ami's hip-hop amongst that particular age group. The following age group that came out is the work of, say, Suming, right? And we see how Suming is now featuring to a much wider popular culture that we see in places like Japan and Korea and his adaptations towards these aspects of modernity, which are very different to what we saw in Ami's hip-hop, even though there's, you know, there's a 10, 10 year difference between that. But this is all part of the processes of tradition. So one can observe not only tradition within the culture, but we can also view how each papa, each age group, identifies themselves at different stages in their history. Um, and I'm just gonna end kind of just talk a little bit about about us. So the this this kind of this period we've just establishing the Northern Institute of Taiwan Studies at our university. But a major part of this is going to be a centre for Austronesian studies. And the key thing for that centre will be to put the Pacific part in our Asia Pacific program. But I just want to say thank you everyone for kind of listening and I'm happy to kind of answer any questions. Thank you. That was, a, uh, as always, a fascinating um, uh, talk. I mean, one of the things I found really um, interesting in your talk was the way that you were um, kind of engaging in dialogue with many of the, uh, the sessions that we've, that we've held over the last uh, three days, but also with your own, how you're kind of linking this talk with your, um, your, your earlier works. Um, I've got, I've got um, a load of questions, but I, let me try and kind of limit, my, limit myself. Uh, here. Um, one of the questions I thought that was really interesting that you raised was this issue of um, to what extent is this urban, uh, rural to urban uh, migration that, we, that we're seeing that's come up in a lot of uh, 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 the uh, presentations in the last couple of days. Is it a good or a bad thing for uh, indigenous um, uh, communities? So this kind of engages with the, the so what element of, 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 of your topic. So we've got a how, a, um, the patterns, the why is what's pushing migration, and the, and the so what, uh, what are the, the, the consequences. Um, I mean, overall, um, um, you've commented quite a bit on the so what for your third period. Um, how would you assess that, that so what question um, for let's say your second period, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the colonial or different the different types of colonial uh, era, um, could you comment a little bit about that? Okay, so I think the the first the first part. Um, if we're looking at whether or not that this rural to urban migration has benefited indigenous peoples, um, that part. Of your first part of that question. I think when we look at this in terms of the tables, um, it's really kind of hard to measure how. I mm. mean, we can't see where these, but, but of course, then, you know, this idea of going to get university education and going to, to study law at Washington has obviously has that benefit to people. Mm. Right? Um, but at the similar, you know, so I think it's a difficult question. I mean, is how they, how indigenous people themselves see this, rural to urban, whether or not they themselves see it as being a benefit. But when we start to look at this through statistics, it's quite hard to see how it has, because we're still seeing these disparities between national averages and mm -hmm. amongst indigenous groups. But again, um, we would probably need to break this down even further and start to see about where are the, you know, where are we seeing these disparities. So um, I would say it's hard to kind of measure about whether it has been of a benefit. I think mm -hmm. Um, on an individual level to many, of course, I would see it would be a benefit, but to some perhaps not so mm -hmm. much, right? Um, that middle section of colonisation on the so what, why is it important kind of so what, mm -hmm. so, right? Um, I think 
population movements, we started to see the opening up of particular kinds of areas during periods of colonization. I think each period of colonization, the way in which that the discourse or our understanding of indigenous people, the labeling and the way in which this is the period of which that this was taking place in. So how indigenous peoples are views was very much conceptualized in the colonization period. Mm -hmm. Um, and this will be through multiple sources of di and different forms of colonization. So we see the conceptualization of indigenous peoples in English through the records of the, of the church. Mm -hmm. We know that um, statistically a large portion of indigenous people are Christian, so the role of the church has played, has played, a, has played a role. Um, um, it's played a part um, both within the understanding of indigenous peoples outside of Taiwan, but also has played a part in how indigenous people themselves conceptualize senses of their, their, their own sense of self. Um, those church-based groups play important roles and stuff like that. So, But of course, also simultaneously, we see this in other periods. So the writings during the Qing period, particularly around the the 18th century and early 19th century, we start to see the methods of which indigenous people were being labelled as played a part and how indigenous peoples are framed. And mm -hmm. So I would say that the, colonizer, the different periods of colonisation have an important part in how indigenous peoples, not just within Taiwan, but globally, have been conceptualised. Um, some of the statistics that you raised, I thought, were, were actually quite... Um, Surprising. I was. I mean, the the one about uh, the shift from six percent to thirty nine percent of indigenous peoples living outside there uh, or living in, in urban areas, um, and and you kind of hinted that if we had the most up to date figures, that would be right. even uh, even higher. That kind of raised two questions for me. Um, one is, to what extent does this rural to urban migration actually start earlier? Uh, what about the Japanese colonial period? Mm. Um, is it evident there? Um, and, and a follow-up question, uh, and again it ties in to something that's been discussed in some of the earlier sessions, is um, is this return to the tribe just a slogan? Uh, is it something that we can actually see statistically? Because you've hinted that um, uh, it's not going to come up in stats. Um, I was wondering um, uh, whether you had any thoughts on, on that. Um, I think there is evidence of we see an increase of indigenous people working within the beginnings of urban areas. We mm -hmm. see, we, 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 we even see it before the Japanese colonial period. Right. So the late Qing period, we're seeing a number of indigenous girls going to school. So like the Street Fellows Girls School had on their role, the majority of the, of the school population there were either Hakka or indigenous, make up by a few others. <laughs> from elite families, but um, we, so we we know that that would have been a movement. But again, there wouldn't necessarily have been the movements of what we're seeing today. Those kind of indigenous girls that are enrolling uh, enrolling at that school were local to the Dantre area then. But mm -hmm. now we they're unrecognized indigenous groups. Um, and I think the same bit in the early Japanese colonial period that that which was moving or migrating to urban areas are those in areas now which will be part of what we would be the unrecognised indigenous groups. I think movements from the interior, more interior areas, the mountainous areas into the things, I think perhaps towards the end um, of the colonial period we would be a bit more evident. There is work that has been done on this um, mm -hmm. and it would be a case of looking a bit closely at this. Um, what we do see is obviously the um, the conscription of indigenous peoples yes. mm -hmm. um, into the Japanese imperial I mean, That's something quite significant when we start to see. And that's also again a population movement yeah. of people. Um, and sorry, what was the next bit of your yeah, I think that was uh, you. You kind of uh, you uh, responded to both of those those questions. <laughs> okay, let's open to some. Um, oh yeah, Daryl and then Jenna. Hi, Jenna. Uh, do you, I hope you don't mind. That's fine. Go. Okay. Uh, thanks um, for the Nikki for the wonderful uh, talk. I thought it 
listening to it, I thought it could be like the introduction to the collection. It was like kind of a state of the field with, with a, a clear theme of the push and pull and human migration over the, the millennia. Um, I just had a couple of comments and a couple of questions. Um, comment on Boulot that uh, you mentioned towards the end, there's like a virtual uh, Boulot or a Boulot in cyberspace idea, especially with um, uh, instant uh, messaging softwares like Line. Right. So there, will, there might be like a Line Chunzu group uh, online. And uh, there's an article I read about this, about language learning uh, groups on online. Anyway, that's um, an obvious way for people today to kind of keep uh, in touch with their with their bulo, even if they're not actually living in this space. And, and bulo, like the word community, can be both a, a place and uh, a group of people, whether or not they're in the same uh, space, as you you explained. And um, a second uh, a second comment is uh, when I was in last time I was in Meishi, one of the families I was staying with, Meishi is a is a is a bulo community in central Taiwan, and they had uh, Feiyong. And that's how they described her. They had a, a Feiyong living with, with them. And so I thought, oh, OK, indigenous people as kind of disadvantaged, but they, they have the economic wherewithal to, to employ a Feiyong. So I really liked what you said about we, we shouldn't define them as economically and socially disadvantaged. But at the same time, the statistics you presented show that on average they are. So that, that, that has to be part of the explanation. But we shouldn't assume that. This d defines uh, every last uh, family. Um, then third uh, question about the Columbian Exchange, because I, I guess you mean syphilis, or I mean syphilis was Mon Montezuma's revenge, right? But uh, it was revenge against uh, um, um, uh, diseases brought by uh, Columbus and, and other uh, conquistadors, and, and, uh, and other explorers, and, and later on conquistadors, Doris. Sorry, my Spanish. Uh, <laughs> currently, <laughs> my Spanish. But um, as for like the biological exchange, I think there's uh, a, a lot of the the plant species, especially in the Western Plains, um, came to Taiwan in, in uh, the the 16th and the 17th centuries. And uh, I think you can document it to a certain can document which species were introduced, and then maybe even some species because uh, it's supposed to be an exchange, right? Uh, species are brought to Taiwan. What about species coming from Taiwan? Uh, the Chinese uh, Wilson, has anyone heard of the, the Chinese Wilson? He's this, a, a plant hunter in the early 20th century, century who uh, mainly went to China and got plant species that were potentially economically mar marketable for horticultural firms. He also came to Taiwan and named a couple of species, and I think he might have even have sold a couple of these species to um, um, to, to uh, horticultural companies, greenhouses in, in, uh, in Europe and, and America. Final uh, thing, um, you mentioned like uh, different uh, layers of colonization in, um, in Sa'idic, uh, the word for pig is babui. And so I asked people from uh, the Philippines, Tagalog, it's also babui. And I asked people from Indonesia, it's vavui. It's obviously the same word, but uh, having listened to your presentation, I guess we don't know for sure which way the, uh, the influence goes. And there's another word for pig, boyak. Boyak and babu. Boyak is wild pig. Babu is, is, is uh, domesticated pig. And so that might be evidence of uh, kind of different layers of language in a pre-Austronesian layer to the language. I don't know how, how much one can generalize to other languages. Final thing. Uh, the word for money in Sadik is pila. And the word for um, uh, silver in Tagalog is pilak. And I think it, they're cognates. But having listened to your presentation, I guess um, it's hard to know which direction the influence went. Could you guess? Like if I said Pila in Sadik and Pilak in, uh, in, in Tagalog, which, uh, do we have enough evidence to say which direction the, uh, the, the word went, where it started, and, and, ha and where it ended up? Thank you. OK, so I think um, from, so thanks very much, Daryl, for um, for your your comments and your questions, I think um, in terms of the kind of the Colum that Colombian exchange thing, I mean, I took that directly from the book title called the Colombian mm -hmm. Exchange. I was talking more about kind of the that European diseases which we see decimate populations within within the Americas. We yeah. can see the same 
we didn't see the same situation with regards to to the populations of not just for Taiwan but but a lot of Pacific Island people. Mm -hmm. um, and this tends to hint towards contact that these are not people who have not been in contact with yeah. European based diseases. Um, um, the term for pigs, I think, was was one of the ones which is, has often come up, but mm -hmm. and that's where the archaeological evidence comes in, mm -hmm. and we see that pig bones, particularly the domestication of pig bones, was earliest in Taiwan. This mm -hmm. is where um, this is where Peter Bellwood, who is yeah. the archaeologist, really the one to kind of been at the forefront, as as is um, Jared Diamond, who becomes. Mm -hmm. Germs and Steel book. I mean, he he, he wrote uh, Taiwan's Gift to the World, which yeah, was for the Nature no, magazine. Yeah. He feels often he feels a bit embarrassed by the fact that people keep quoting Jared Diamond, where he's like, you know, no, I'm just drawing on the scholarship of yeah. other people, um, mainly Peter Bellwood within that. But it was Blust, who is the linguist at the University of Honolulu. I think he is a retired professor and it's that, but was at the University of Honolulu was the one that kind of looked at this linguistically and what Peter Bellwood said like okay I want to find the evidence archaeologically and he, and he did then it was kind of it ran between the two of them and there are other um, kind of linguists that said you know what there's some kind of things and I think money was actually an interesting one because yeah. I think it's hard to locate this archaeologically right so we don't we see Silver, for example, appearing in the Philippines way before it appeared in Taiwan, but that doesn't okay, mean that would be evidence. But yeah, yeah. if we are talking, but then we could also be that there were other. I mean, but but you know, there's also shells which yeah. appear earlier in Taiwan yeah. than appear in the Philippines. We don't know at where we because shells were often used as a monetary form. Yeah. Um, it could well be that this was a word that was used for money. But we don't know what that connection, whether it was to shells yeah. initially. And so there may well have been a word for a shell that's something which an animal lived in, like a tortoise or something yeah. like that. But then there would have been an additional word for that that's been used in exchange, right? Yeah. So we could well have had it earlier in Taiwan. But that's where the, the genetic argument comes in. Like we can't keep doing this thing by looking at linguistic paleontology mm -hmm. because people may well have changed the name of their word for it, and I think money was one of actually. I think money was one that Stephen Oppenheimer talked about by being like actually that can be quite problematic because mm -hmm. silver was obviously a word which was then used for exchange of money, particularly yeah. in the Philippines mm -hmm. after, and obviously also after Spanish conquest of the Philippines would have seen a major introduction of silver for the use of money. Mm -hmm. But then of course they, whatever local people were using as as, the, as currency, mm. well, then the, just the word would have changed to white yeah, okay. material. And I think we're missing meant something else besides silver before. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so um, I think that was also quite an interesting one. So I think this idea, but that's why I, I mean, I, my, you know, I theorize that it, we could have seen an, an exchange, a back and forth movement. Mm -hmm. And I think that would actually kind of, in many ways, add to things. But the problem with the back movement into Taiwan is that we're not seeing the development of, particularly in boat culture mm -hmm. and shipbuilding, we're not seeing that returning. Um, and so there would have been there would have been other forms, perhaps they just didn't need to kind of be travelling back on, you know, maybe they didn't want to. And this is, this is where it all becomes kind of an interesting thing and I, I think this going for me or this idea of going back to the origin perhaps missing my what I'm trying to do and my, my, my key thing here um, as something that I can con use to conceptualize it is material culture mm -hmm. right is that populations move with material culture mm -hmm. so when we're looking at that Taiwan village that family of five people who were put on the boat at Kaohsiung that arrived in Southampton and came up by the train to to London, um, that 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 family brought with them material culture. That material culture got left behind, mm -hmm. and then people then began to kind of conceptualize and say well, what indigenous people are. So I think what we do, and need, we see this in contemporary um, population movements to urban areas, will be how creative industries work. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. perhaps material culture is something that we can see moving with people, and we do, the pig, pigs would be yeah. one, and money 
10 days in the hole. Okay, yeah, Jenna. Okay. Um, my question kind of brings together two thoughts from your talk. Yeah. The first is that, um, I mean, I quite agree with the idea of not positioning the indigenous narrative as one of injustice, because I think we can all agree it's very important that indigenous people kind of have control of their own narrative in a world where yeah, a lot of people, I think especially China, but a lot of people want to use indigenous the, the indigenous narrative to sort of meet their own ends. Um, but also I was very interested to hear about your use of the word colonialism to talk about not just Japan, but also Chinese incursions into Taiwan. I have long felt that, for example, the Qing era and the ROC era could also be called colonial, and I'm happy to know that I'm not crazy. But um, I noticed, interestingly, you said that you, you kind of made it seem like colonialism ended in 1987. Um, when we talk about indigenous people taking control of their own narrative and what that means in terms of, you know, whatever, um, I would say many indigenous would not agree that colonialism ended in 1987. I mean, we have Tsai Ing-wen who, sure, she apologized for blah, 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 but is still not willing to return a million hectares of land that indigenous say they are entitled to. Is that not still a form of colonialism? And where do we draw the line between us deciding our interpretation of what the narrative should be and stepping back and letting them, them come out and say, no, that's not really how it is, if that question makes any sense yeah, at all? Very I mean, I mean, I completely agree with you. I mean, I, it's just, for, in many ways, simplicity that I put 1987 okay. as a particular date because of the um, end of martial law, but I, that would be the one. But absolutely, but I'd say that colonialism for most Fair Nation peoples or native peoples um, tends to have never really left if a majority settle, settler groups have a right. We see this in the case of Native Americans, First Nation Canadians, Aborigines and Maori, where they all potentially would believe that colonization still exists. I thought I would absolutely agree. I, uh, it, it was just for giving a period, I mean. Um, but I, um, your part on um, uh, kind of the, the Qing narrative of colonization, I think, I think it's always important that people, um, and here and now I'm going to sound like Bruce Jacobs. I think it's always important that people understand that the Qing, the Manchu Empire colonized China and colonized Taiwan, but not necessarily as a single entity. So the colonization of Taiwan was very different to the colonization of, of China. Um, one a good example of this is that foreign people could own property in Taiwan, they couldn't own property in China. That would be one example of a difference between between these things. Um, and that's really where my research, my own research came in in the book with Routledge was to make that case that we saw a very different late Qing period in Taiwan than we saw in, in, in China proper. Um, and so, but I always say that framing, set, framing it as settler colonialism then gives agency to indigenous people by making it clear that they that the peoples that were coming from the 17th century onwards were settler peoples, right? Um, and so we then also we start to see the kinds of degrees of factionalism amongst different groups of settlement, um, particularly in the 18th century, we can start to look at that. And then we can start to open up this more if for comparative purposes. I think the comparatives to the United States is very, very clear when we start to frame it in this particular way. We see a westward expansion in the United States, and we see an eastward expansion in Taiwan, but almost at the same kind of period, and for the same purpose, the opening of new lands that had not yet been farmed, and what that meant for the, for the indigenous people. So um, the Oregon Trail, for example, in the American story, we see in similar kinds of trails, other trails in the Taiwan context as well. But yeah. Okay, yeah, friend. Hi. Um, oh, is, is, is the mic on? Underneath. <laughs> oh. Yes. Um, thanks very much for the talk. It was, um, it was very interesting. Um, 
I hope we haven't kind of exhausted the theme of uh, language transmission because I was I was kind of interested in coming back to that actually. Okay. Um, because so it's it's quite easy to see how um, sort of words for in material culture like you know the word for pig, the word for silver might be um, transmitted um, as part of a as part of exchange. Um, but it's a little bit. What what are the kind of um, I'm interested in what the how how is the how are other bits of language kind of um, how do we conceptualize the other bits of transmission of other things in language which are maybe not um, which wouldn't be involved in trade assuming that trade is kind of the mechanism of of language transmission. Um, I, it's a very 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 good question and unfortunately not one I can answer because I'm don't come from this uh, from a linguistic perspective. So looking at other angles of language um, is not really something that I can answer, I'm afraid, but I don't know if anyone else has. Did anyone else want to respond to that, that question? I could just say a little thing. Okay, yeah. Because when you were talking about the periodization of the uh, Austronesian expansion, yeah. it really helped me understand why there would be such a similarity between language I study in central Taiwan and uh, Tagalog. I don't know the details, but if you compare Tagalog to the language I study, the, uh, the verbal morphology is uh, uncannily similar. <laughs> they have four focuses, and the, um, the affixes that indicate the focus uh, the focus as a kind of subject, so actor focus, pass, passive focus, patient focus, uh, location, and uh, uh, <coughs> instrument. It's the same in Tagalog, and the, the affixes are the same, prefixes, suffixes, infixes, so the same, it's uncanny. <laughs> but you don't see such a, a close uh, similarity with language like, like Maori. But that's explained, by, I think, by what Nikki was saying about, the, about when um, the people uh, went where they went, the periodization, the, the timing of the, of the expansion. Is that what you were asking about? <laughs> yeah, I, I, suppose, I suppose I was, I was quite interested in if, if we have any idea about the, the actual sort of the mechanism of how the transmission happened yeah. in that sense. That I don't know. Well, Maybe I think Nikki would be... Well, I think in terms of the mechanism, I think it was, I think, um, I, I think one of the things that Peter, I mean, I'm going to refer to Peter Bowood, who is the one who looked at this, particularly in the, the in Luzon, in northern of the northern Philippines. Um, one way in which they were doing this was that the community there was it was a relatively small community, um, and that that through the processes of kind of interaction and trade certain words were adapted for things they didn't have. So introduction for rice, for example, they just took that particular word, um, and then subsequently it was them that were introducing rice down. So it wasn't just this one kind of, um, this one Taiwan group who decided to go to, 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 to Luzon, and then they, the family was continued until they got really old. And then, um, but it, what we would have seen is in the state of the processes, but that it kind of exchange of goods. But one of the things that we interest me is whether or not that amongst that group in Luzon, where we see a return of the language, one of the things that we could see is return of the people, right? Mm -hmm. Because that starts to account for changes in the genetic which is where the genetic arguments came from, but actually the fact that the people came up through Southeast Asia as opposed to down from Taiwan is because we do get Southeast Asian genetic markers amongst yeah. indigenous peoples, particularly in southern Taiwan. But that, to me, that makes sense if people came back into Maori. So we don't know how... We, what we do know is that that period was a relatively quick period. Um, so we could have just had this consistent exchange. And I think that's probably how we see the mechanisms of that. But I, honestly, I think most of this would have been about trade. Um, one of the ways in which that it could happen would be just through being driven off course because of sea currents. One of the things that's quite important is the conversation I also had with Adam when we were looking at this in the concepts of Spanish for Moses is that we have to not use our modern sensibilities about how we navigate oceans, mm -hmm. right? Um, the crossing of the Taiwan Strait, even Taiwan is like 150 kilometers from mainland 
um, China to to the mainland part of of China to Taiwan, it's not easy to navigate across. So when we start talking about the Ming Dynasty's John Her voyages, there's no he didn't go to Taiwan. Right? There's no evidence to suggest that he did. Plus, it's very difficult to get across that, even though that he followed Arabic trade routes. That's because the winds would have been right to do that, right? So the idea of this Taiwan going to things may well have been first as trade, like maybe a a conscious decision to just keep sailing. Um, or it could be blown off course and then arrived on this particular thing and then opened up for that thing. That's a possibility. We know that this happened amongst European shipwrecks going through that. So that, if you're talking about the kind of the mechanisms of how it moved, yeah. that would be. So in a way, though, that's... Sorry, if um, no, no, you no. want to go on to another question, then uh, feel free. Um, but it, in a way, that almost sounds like um, it's quite similar to those sort of older ideas, I guess, about about sort of tying people, that in, that like having people spreading with the language right. in, in the same time, in, in that sense, right? Yeah, I mean, because the archaeological evidence seems to suggest that the people moved with the language. Yeah. Okay. Um, because the, we're seeing the archaeology appearing. I think. It's just that one part, that circle that I showed, yeah. Around what was called the Wallace Stone back in that sort of place. Um, around that thing just north of that, we've not seen the archaeological evidence. And that's where we're getting the geneticists starting from. They think that's the start, starting point around Melanesia, that kind of area. We're seeing this starting point because the archaeology is not there. Um, and then we start to see the archaeology appearing as well, and they think, you know, maybe that's where it came from. We have a different genetic makeup, or we have genetic markers that are present here or are present everywhere else, um, but we're not having the archaeological evidence. But, I mean, sometimes languages can move without moving with people, right? We start to see this amongst lingua franca, right? Or, so Portuguese, for example, became the language of trade through much of the Pacific, but we didn't necessarily have Portuguese. I mean, Formosa as a name, there was no Portuguese settlement on Taiwan, but <laughs> Taiwan was named Formosa in Portuguese, right? That's because that was the language that was being spoken on the Dutch ships. I mean, the Dutch ships didn't necessarily have Dutch people, and this, again, is our modern sensibilities to sense that our, our, our ideas of the, of the nation today is very different. Wars were not, so like, the Napoleonic Wars were not just British soldiers fighting French soldiers. They were French soldiers fighting French soldiers because Britain, the British armies were somehow paying more. I mean, this modern sensibilities needs to be often needs to be corrected, and I think this this is the case in point here. But what we do see in terms of the language movements is there is archaeological evidence to suggest that they are at least people moving with that language. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Very much for your engaging talk, and also thanks to Jenna, and because my question is kind of uh, related to your second question. So um, I'm wondering whether there is really post-colonial studies in Taiwan, because if we admit that, uh, it means uh, colonial realism really ends in Taiwan. And let's go back to your categorization of uh, different types of uh, colonialisms. Uh, you use 1987 as an end for. Uh, the colonialism in exile, this type, and uh, usually we say um, mm, the end of colonialism means uh, a colony either uh, topples the colonial regime and gains its political independence or uh, becomes colonized by a new colonial regime. But in 1987, uh, none of these situations took place. Uh, rather, what took place in 1987 was the end of martial law, or namely the beginning of democratization. But, um, so, are you assuming that uh, democratization as uh, the end of uh, colonialism? If yes, uh, do you think it's possible for a country or a regime to uh, be both democratic and colonial at the same time? Mm -hmm. So, personally, my answer was no, but uh, after I started uh, studying graduate school at the, in the U.S., my answer becomes yes, it's definitely possible. Okay, thank you. I, I mean, again, my response would be similar to Jenna's. I, I, I don't have a very strong opinion on putting 1987. It was just a marker to kind of end that kind of thing. And I've just used... Um, 
I just used the martial law and the end of martial law as a thing, of, of, of something in exile. Because we did, I mean, democratization did bring change, right? Um, but I, would, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you. But the question on post-colonial thought, I mean, one thing we could turn around and say is that we saw significant change in 2004 with the Sunflower Movement, right? And um, one possibility, well, what, 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 one reason in which we can look at the Sunflower Movement as being a culture is a shift from ethnic nationalism to civic nationalism. But I wouldn't necessarily say it brought, I mean, it depends on how, who are we referring to as being the colonial overlord, right? Yes. Um, if we're talking about it in relations to the Republic of China, then of course, then that didn't end in 1987. So it depends on, on what angle we're actually looking at, right? So I don't disagree. I, I don't have. A, 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 it's not a point of thing I'm trying to say that 1987. So I don't disagree with you, but I do. I don't think that there is a post colonial discussion, so to speak, in Taiwan. But I do think that there are discussions on post-colonialism. Um, I don't. I, th I feel that there is discussions of post-colonialism, but I don't necessarily know that we are in a post-colonial period. I don't think we are. Um, but it's not as if people aren't engaging with it as a discussion, or as a discourse, I think they are. But I, I, I don't have strong attachments to my... 1987, lady, <laughs> and I don't disagree with what you're saying. Yeah, so it's not it's not an important mark for me. It was just a, a case to kind of end. Uh, but Adam, did you have a question? Because I, I was there. Uh, I had a message from behind that you had a question, but really, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I had questions, but I wasn't going to ask one. I think you had an actual question. <laughs> Hello. Um, I was just curious, um, when you're working in indigenous studies and anything, surely, I mean, you're, you're um, cognizant that whatever conclusions you reach and whatever direction you're going in are either um, in sync or not in sync with certain political desires by other parties, right? And as an academic, of course, you want to sort of follow whatever truth you yourself can come up with, but when you start, for example, um, orienting Taiwan towards Austronesia, you know, Austronesian lands, right? That plays into a certain sort of political narrative of Taiwan, which was not in your talk, and which you may or may not agree with, or what have you, but just as a practicing academic, my question is, when you're pursuing your research, how much do you think about, well, this does seem to work awfully well or not well with what, say, the Taiwanese state is trying to accomplish in distinguishing itself from mainland China, you know, something like that. Yeah, no, I understand what you mean. I think, I mean, for me and my perspective as an academic is that I feel, like, for example, I'll give you, I'll give you some, so Asia-Pacific Studies is our program, okay, now that is a very Eurocentric thing to look at, right, in terms of Asia, Asia Pacific, right. Um, a very political one today would be Indo-Asia Pacific. So all of these things, East Asia, they all have Northeast Asia, they all Southeast Asia, they all have political connotations, right. Um, but we need to have a certain marker of an area in order for us to have it as a degree program and typically degree programs are run by your attractions for students so you have the sexier it sounds the better it is and I think we're moving away from the concepts of East Asia I think we're moving away from that and that's largely to do with rise of Vietnam like if it's Vietnam in East Asia or it's Vietnam in Southeast Asia what does it mean to be Southeast Asian and so um, for me, personally, I think looking at this and framing it, this as a part of the a Western Pacific or as a Pacific, I think is important because it also opens up the position of Japan because Japan somehow hasn't found a narrative in the post, in my opinion, hasn't really found a narrative in the post-war period. It's not at war anymore. And, um, and I feel that... Looking at this within the Pacific concept, just it, it, for me, it just answers or it asks different questions, and I think that's the point. It's not. I think the reason why I I do 
is to ask different questions on on Taiwan, right? Mm -hmm. I want to uh, I want to look at Taiwan outside of being framed within an East Asian narrative, but rather to explore it differently because I think you come to different conclusions that may may or may not be the right conclusion, but at least the conclusion that can be opened up. It gives a different level to the debate. And that's what I think. So it starts to then, when you start looking at it as a Pacific, then you start to include it in a narrative of the Philippines, for example, and that connection. Its closest neighbour is the Philippines, right? Um, and that's interesting, right? Um, but when we, if you talk about it in an East Asian and a Southeast Asian context, we don't think about Taiwan's closest neighbour as the Philippines. Mm -hmm. right? We talk about Taiwan's closest neighbour as being China, but that's not its closest neighbour, right? Mm -hmm. Its closest neighbour would be the Philippines and Japan. Mm -hmm. And I think that raises an interesting thing for me. Anyway. Okay, we've almost uh, run out of time, and we have quite a short coffee break, so um, we're going to have to take one very quick last question. Go ahead. Yeah. Very wonderful speaking. I just want to show maybe some story, or maybe this is not a question. Because in Taiwan, the Aboriginal culture always has some kind of special talent. So actually, so many music stars are from the tribe, from Bubu. So I think, it, I'm just wondering, is it possible because they have to go to the, the city and they can show that talent? And sometimes you can see some interesting story. They always go back to their Bubu, try to protect their own, their own culture. So I, I think maybe, the story about the music, or maybe about the sports, are sometimes a very good example for you. Because many years ago, when Chen Shui Bian became president, he invited Zhang Guimei to sing the, the song in, in the national ceremony. And the uh, army faced some kind of difficulties, but because she cannot go to mainland China anymore. So, yeah, so I think sometimes it's quite interesting. But now there's another very famous star, Alin, is a very famous female star. She went to China and very famous because he, she attended the, the, the I'm a Singer, the biggest TV program in China. So I think this kind of story maybe is, is kind of attractive if you can try to show in your articles. And Taiwanese people will like to read this and are looking forward to this. Kind of <laughs> 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 then, perhaps if I could just quickly very okay, yes, respond, okay. respond to that. Um, and that links in today being uh, World Cup. And I think one of the biggest things that we often have to remember is the appropriation of the AMI song for Italia 90, right? Um, that was stolen by Enya. And I think that kind of discussion is, tends to be made and it's linking back to that. So um, uh, very interesting also on sports um, is that the part of uh, the work that Shani Museum does is that annual post the competition for university students across Taiwan and one of the projects I've been involved in for the past three years is to have that exhibition exhibited within the UK and then this year we will have, um, we will have it again but I will be inviting the winner to come and talk about that. But the theme of that is sports and movements and within the indigenous society. So that kind of thing is coming out and it does feature in my work. So have no fear, Nikki's here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay, so let's thank Nikki one more time. Thank you.